I want to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, Akil Reed Amar. And Akil is the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches constitutional law in both Yale College and Yale Law School. Uh, after graduating from Yale College Summa Cum Laude in 1980 and from Yale Law School in 1984 and clerking for then Judge and now Justice Stephen Breyer, Amar joined the Yale faculty in 1985 at the age of 26. That is very <laughs> impressively young. Um, Amar's work has won awards from both the American Bar Association and the Federalist Society, and he has been cited by Supreme Court justices across the spectrum in more than 40 cases. Uh, he regularly testifies before Congress at the invitation of both parties and in surveys of judicial citations and or scholarly, scholarly citations. He invariably ranks among America's five most cited mid-career legal scholars. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, has written wildly, widely for popular publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Time, and the Atlantic. And he was the, an informal consultant to the popular TV show, The West Wing. Uh, he is the author of more than a hundred law review articles and several books, most notably The Bill of Rights, uh, America's Unwritten, and The Constitution Today. His latest and most ambitious book, The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Con Conversation, 1760 to 1840, is recently published. Um, we're actually selling his book. So if you, um, by the end of this lecture, I'm sure you're all going to be inspired to buy a copy. So I will add a link um, in the chat where the book will be available for, I believe it's $40 plus tax and shipping. Um, and they will also be available for um, pickup at the Lifthills Historical Society. So on that note, um, I could not be happier to introduce Akil Amar, Amid Amar. Um, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Well, thank you, Kate. It's a great honor to be here. Um, and I noticed from the chat some um, friends from uh, previous uh, adventures um, in uh, Northern Connecticut, uh, Lisa and uh, others from uh, um, the Sharon area. So nice to see everyone, at least virtually. Um, you've asked me to talk about the filibuster in particular, and I promise to do that and I will do that. Um, and uh, the title uh, that I proposed was Rule 22, Catch 22, and Election 22. Um, you will very shortly understand what that all means because I'm going to spend, I hope, no more than 22 minutes talking about the filibuster. And then we're going to switch. I've actually set my alarm. Um, and then we're going to switch and you're going to ask me questions about the filibuster or anything else uh, uh, about constitutional law that intrigues you. And so we're going to have a lot of time for back and forth. So let me, um, though, briefly explain uh, what the title means. Rule 22, Catch 22, Election 22. Uh, and, and as I said, I'll try to, to spend about 22 minutes on this, maybe 23 at most. Um, the, I set my alarm on my iPhone so um, it'll go off at a certain point and remind me that it's time to, to switch gears. Okay, so what is the filibuster? The filibuster is a practice in the United States Senate um, by which um, it requires more than a simple majority to end debate and vote on a measure. Um, rule 22, is the Senate rule that embodies um, uh, the uh, specifics of this debate uh, procedure, this debate provision. And let me begin by telling you, here's what's really important about Rule 22. There are many things that are important about Rule 22, but one thing is it, it does not apply to each and every Senate action, but only certain actions. For example, it no longer as a practical matter, applies to um, presidential um, nominations for uh, 
cabinet positions, for lower court positions, for Supreme Court positions. Um, it does not apply to certain kinds of legislation, um, uh, certain budget matters, for example, which are handled by a thing called reconciliation. Um, but the rule does purport to apply to a certain category of Senate action. So that's the first thing you need to understand. And it purports to require more than a simple majority, 51 votes, 50 votes plus, if necessary, the, um, the vote of the vice president, um, purports to require more than that to end debate. Um, and therefore, um, a, a, a vote on the main measure, which, um, a, a, a pr procedure known as cloture, closing or clo closure is really another, is a, is an, um, uh, a synonym, but cloture closes or ends debate. But now here's another key point. Um, the filibuster rule, rule 22, does not now and never has purported to be a rule about what vote is necessary on the bill itself. Um, uh, the constitution itself, in my view, provides for simple, and in the view of most scholars, provides for simple majority rule on the bill itself filibuster rule is only a rule about ending debate. We come back to that. Filibuster rule also has one other key feature. It purports to restrict uh, or to uh, set forth the ability, uh, the, uh, uh, restrict the um, ability of the Senate to change the rule itself. It purports to say, oh, if you wanna change rule 22, you're gonna need more than simply uh, 51 votes in the Senate, simple majority of the Senate. You're gonna need a two thirds vote, says rule 22, um, a two thirds vote of those um, uh, voting. Um, if everyone were voting, that'd be 67. If not everyone votes, it could be lower than that, but it could be as high as 67. So to repeat, rule 22 is a rule for ending debate, but not actually doesn't, has never purported to be a rule on the vote on the, me the measure itself, the bill itself. It, it has a limited scope, it doesn't apply universally, and it purports to limit, actually um, uh, restrict the ability of the Senate to change the rule itself by simple majority vote. That takes us to catch 22. See, because it, it, it's a supermajority um, rule to end debate and it purports to require in effect a supermajority to change that rule. Now enter Akhil Omar, I'm gonna tell you another thing. To the extent it tries to do that, and it tries to do that in a way that prevents the Senate from changing the rule by a simple majority vote. Um, and in so doing as a practical matter, makes it impossible to um, uh, actually um, enact certain pieces of legislation that do have the support of a, a simple majority of the Senate. To the extent it does those things, it is unconstitutional. And at any day, moment, on any day, a simple majority of the Senate can reinterpret the rule or modify it, notwithstanding what Rule 22 says. Because if Rule 22 actually entrenched itself that way, made it impossible as a practical matter to amend itself, um, even though um, a, a, a mere maj a majority, albeit a mere majority, a simple majority, um, wanted to change it, to the extent it did that, it would be unconstitutional. And that's not just what Akhil Amar says, that's what the Senate itself now understands and does. That's called the nuclear option. And candidly, I'm one of the, the fathers of the nuclear option, <laughs> the father of the, the hydrogen bomb, if you, if you will, the Edward Teller of um, uh, the Robert Oppenheimer of um, filibuster reform. Um, it is now clear, as a, uh, on the basis of precedents that were set by both Democrat Harry Reid uh, in November 2013 and more recently um, Mitch McConnell um, uh, when each was uh, in, in turn the majority leader of the Senate, each in effect reinterpreted Rule 22 um, and did so by a simple majority vote and in the process in effect 
changed Rule 22, um, amended Rule 22, even though Rule 22 says you can't do that without two thirds of the Senate um, uh, uh, voting for such a thing. So they didn't amend it, they just reinterpreted it and they were eight and they reinterpreted by a simple majority vote. Harry Reid did that for all appointments except for the Supreme Court. And Mitch McConnell expanded that, um, extended that to Supreme Court appointments as well in, in the case of Neil Gorsuch. Now, having done that, and each party has done it, and what goes around comes around, the rules for the Democrats have to be the same as the rules for the Republicans. It's now clear, regardless of what Rule 22 actually purports to say, that um, a simple majority on any day can basically modify the filibuster, get rid of it altogether. All it takes is 51 votes, 50 senators plus Kamala Harris today, for example, if it were a party line vote. It need not be a party line vote. It'd be nice if certain things um, in Senate weren't party line votes, but all you need to change the rule is 51 votes, a simple majority. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about why that's so in the next few minutes. And then eventually I'm gonna tell you about election 22. So I told you a little bit about rule 22. I told you if, it, if you couldn't change it uh, or amend it away by a simple majority vote, it would be a catch 22. It would entrench itself in a way that actually violates fundamental first principles of constitutional law, which is the majority's rule within certain, um, in, in, in certain respects. And this is one of those respects. Uh, so if you couldn't change it by simple majority vote, it would be an entrenched catch 22 that would violate the constitution in at least two different ways. Article one, section seven and article one, section five. Um, article one is the legislative article of the constitution. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about why that's my position, why the Senate has come to adopt that position, both parties. Um, and then I'll just tell you a little bit about election 22, the, the election coming up and why that turns out to be a particularly important one for the filibuster and more generally. Okay, so why do I say, um, and now the Senate actually agrees with me, um, that simple majority rule is um, uh, how the Senate actually uh, operates and must operate. Um, so uh, the Constitution, uh, and in, in, in two ways, Article One, Section 7 says, how does a bill become law? And it doesn't specify the rule, um, the, the number of votes you need in the House or Senate, um, but precisely because it doesn't specify, um, the obvious um, uh, rule is majority rule. Um, and that's how it's always been from day one, in, in, um, and even before day one in Parliament in Britain, even before day one in every state, in every state, including Connecticut, uh, 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 colonially and uh, uh, in independent America after 1776. So every state, Pass the bill, simple majority in, in each chamber, if it's bicameral, originally Pennsylvania wasn't bicameral, Georgia wasn't bicameral, simple majority, that's how the House of Commons works, that's how every state legislature um, worked, every colonial legislature worked, it's how the first Congress um, worked, it's how every Congress since then has worked. When you're voting on a bill, simple majorities suffice, and Rule 22 never, ever, ever purported to say otherwise purported to just be a rule about ending debate and not voting on the bill. A rule about getting to the floor, just like in order to get to the floor, you might need to go through a committee. And there are all sorts of rules about what committees you gotta go through, whether it's the rules committee or the judiciary committee or the foreign affairs committee or what have you. Um, but rule 22 never have the chutzpah to try to say we're changing the rules about how, the, uh, how um, a bill becomes law. Some of you maybe are old enough as am I to remember um, Schoolhouse Rock, um, uh, that, uh, and, um, or that little ditty, I I'm just a bill sitting here on Capitol Hill, how a bill becomes law. And it's just con law 101, simple majority of the House, simple majority of the Senate, that's how a bill becomes law. It doesn't say majority rule in the constitution, it's taken for granted, it's the default rule. Um, um, wh where the constitution Provide, um, envisions a supermajority rule, it says so explicitly. So it takes two thirds of each house to amend the constitution and then three quarters of the states and it says so explicitly. It takes two thirds of the Senate to convict in an impeachment case and it says so explicitly. It takes 
um, two thirds of a house to expel a member where there's no bicameralism and it says so, uh, one of its own members, it says so explicitly. Say it a different way. If you can by simple, um, if, if the, the, uh, the Senate can change the, the rule from 51 to 67 to pass a law, why can't it change it to 75, to 88? To, um, so if it were 88, it would, it would be harder to pass an ordinary bill than to pass a constitutional amendment, which again is in the constitution and it only says two thirds. So, um, um, and obviously there's a lower number than two thirds that needs to be required for, a, for an ordinary bill and that lower number is simple majority rule. It goes without saying. Um, and even before the constitution came along and even before state legislatures were in the picture, that's what John Locke said. That's what Benjamin Franklin um, uh, said in the Philadelphia Convention. That's what Thomas Jefferson said when he wrote manuals of, of Senate procedure. Um, and actually earlier notes on, uh, on the state of Virginia, which is the only book that he ever um, published. He published it before the constitution was adopted. And building on Locke, it's a, just almost a mathematical point, just like every um, uh, uh, a body has a, a center of gravity, um, a legislative body has a center of gravity, and that's the simple majority. That's the center of gravity of the body. It's a mathematical principle. Um, so Locke thought that, Franklin thought that, Jefferson thought that, all the founders thought that. From day one, that's how the Senate operated. It didn't have Rule 22 until the 20, 20th century. Um, it operated by simple majority rule when passing bills. You may say, okay, Professor, maybe you're right about that. But Rule 22 isn't about passing bills. It's a rule of debate. And can't you have a different rule to, of, for closing debate and getting to the floor? That's where Article 1, Section 5 comes in. Article 1, Section 5 says, yes, each chunk gets to adopt rules for its own proceedings. But by what voting rule does Article 1, Section 5 operate? And the answer is the same as Article 1, Section 7 for adopting bills. It's simple majority rule also. Congre and, and that's how the first Congress, when it adopted its rules, it used simple majority rule. And if it didn't, and the House did that as well, if it didn't, there'd be an infinite regress problem. How do we vote? What, by what voting rule do we decide you know, what procedures we should adopt? By what voting rule do we decide the voting rule for deciding the procedures? By what voting rule do we decide the voting rule for deciding the voting rule for the procedures? It would be an infinite regress and it wasn't. Congress, the first Congress on day one, um, the House and the Senate both set up committees and they, they decided the rules for their proceedings and they were adopted by simple majority. And what that first Congress can do, every succeeding Congress can do because they're no different than the first Congress. They have the same rights to change the rules that the first Congress did, each House um, House and Senate to set up the rules. So there was no filibuster at the found at all. And I can prove that to you in five seconds. If there were, I can do it two different ways. If there were any, now people talked and talked and talked, but at the end of the day, after everyone, and the Senate was smaller, after everyone stopped talking, they voted. That's how it worked. Everyone gets to talk and everyone gets to vote. And that's how it worked. And I can prove it by saying, if any major, and if it really, and if the current rules, even Rule 22, are a genuine rule of debate, they're perfectly fine. What they can't become is a rule of decision, a rule that prevents a determined majority if it wants to from actually affecting its will and voting on the bill and passing it if it wants. That's what Rule 22 cannot do, because if it does that, it has impermissibly modified Article 1, Section 7, changed the rules um, but how you pass a law and, and one house of the Congress can't do that. And I can prove to you that no, um, that the filibuster didn't operate early on simply by saying, if it did, name me one important bill that was filibustered to death before the Civil War. Oh, we can't, no one can. No one's ever come up with one of any significance. That's because yeah, people voted and they talked and they talked and they talked, they yacked and then they voted. I'll say it a different way, because I know you're a very sophisticated audience, um, uh, interested in history. Many of you have um, heard about the Compromise of 1850, in which for the first time, the free states get a majority of the Senate. California comes in as a free state without any offsetting slave state. 
earlier, when free states came in, you need to offset them with state states. Maine comes in in 1819, 1820, and it's offset by Missouri. And, and other free states come in and they're offset by slave states. And the, the free states had a majority in the House from the, the, uh, the earliest moments um, uh, in the House of Representatives. But the Senate was equally balanced between free and slave states basically until 1850. And California comes in as a free state without an offsetting slave state. And that was a very big deal. You know from your American history, it was a very big deal. It would not have been a big deal if there was some strong supermajority requirement um, to, um, of, of the Senate. So then if there were, who cares if there's a simple majority of free states? They can't do anything without um, a supermajority, but that's not true. They could do anything they wanted. It could pass any bill that they wanted at the end of the day with the, with the barest of majorities and the compromise of 1850 was a very big deal. So when did we begin to get this entrenched filibuster? Well, in the early, after the Civil War, um, there were some uh, efforts to uh, a filibuster. Um, um, I'm getting a question. Can you tell us what a filibuster is? Yes, I told you in the first five minutes. So you have to go back now because this is being recorded and hear it again, okay? Because I told you what the filibuster was. It's a rule of procedure for um, the Senate about um, how debate ends. That's what it is. And, the, and, the, and, and it's embodied in a thing called Rule 22. Uh, I, those of you who don't know, I just there was a chat that just um, question that just popped up. Okay, so in the 20th century, so, uh, and, and where did the filibuster really come from? Southern states, uh, former slave states, recognizing that they were um, in the minority in the new order, especially after the Civil War, tried to block various things by coming up with um, rules that enabled a minority to prevent um, legislation. And in this kind of sordid history, the filibuster does in the 20th century, it was basically used by um, Southern senators to block um, civil rights laws, voting rights laws, anti-lynching laws, and the like. Um, and they went around saying, oh, this goes back to the founding and blah, blah. And it's, it's horse manure. It's just not true. Um, um, Robert Byrd convinced himself of this, you know, but he was not a constitutional scholar. He was a Southern senator from West Virginia early on, a former Klansman, voted against the Civil Rights Act of 64, um, repented, changed. I, I love it when people, you know, uh, um, repent and, and get better over time. Um, but he, and he persuaded himself maybe that uh, it goes back to the founding, but it doesn't at all. That's, and that's not just my view. That's the view of the great political scientist, a uh, uh, great um, uh, uh, David Mayhew, my, my senior colleague at Yale, who along with Norm Ornstein is probably one of the two um, most consequential scholars of the, um, the, the Congress. So, um, so the filibuster doesn't come from the founding, um, uh, not in the constitution. Um, uh, we could get rid of it tomorrow if we wanted to. Um, uh, we have modified it um, on both the democratic side, Harry Reid for um, uh, appointments and the Republican side, Mitch McConnell for Supreme Court appointments. We could expand um, the scope of that 50, uh, a simple majority principle for ending debate. So it, not, so it applies not just to reconciliation bill, budget bills, not just to appointment bills, but any other bill you like, that would be called the nuclear option. We can do it any day of the week, not just on the first day of the session. And we've done it already. The, uh, the, the nuclear option genie is already out of the bottle. Okay, finally, just a few words on election 22. Um, it, Cause right now, the, the Democrats have the teeniest of majorities in the House, you know, 50-50 in the Senate, the, the possibility of a tie being broken by uh, Kamala Harris. Um, uh, they have the presidency for now. 22 is an off-year election. A lot of uh, third of the Senate's up for grabs. Um, House, all seats in the House of Representatives. Um, and right now, folks on the Democratic side who um, are closest to the middle, uh, Joe Manchin, Kristen Cinema are skeptical of filibuster reform. Um, and so I'm not sure even that they want to vote for it. Um, but um, if the Republicans um, thwart various important big bills, voting rights bills and other bills, they may be forced to do so. Um, in any event, we're going to have a referendum again, in effect, on, on the Senate in um, 
2022. And here's what could change. Because um, if the Democrats manage to hold on, they could, by changing the filibuster rule, make DC a state. That would be two more senators on the Democratic side. Make Puerto Rico a state. That would be two more senators on the Democratic side. And then it would be a little bit easier. They'd have a little bit more running room even to do filibuster reform of a more general sort. If um, uh, um, they could even try to peel off certain uh, moderate Republicans um, uh, who in their heart may be closer to Liz Cheney uh, than they are to uh, Kevin McCarthy types. Um, uh, someone like Susan Collins from Maine, someone like um, uh, uh, who could get elected as a Democrat or Republican in Maine, uh, Maine voted for um, Joe Biden. Uh, um, uh, Lisa Murkowski in uh, uh, Alaska could, um, well, no matter what happens um, uh, in her party, be able to make it to um, uh, the general election. A lot of, a lot of people are, um, especially Republicans, are worried about being primaried um, from the base, Republicans on the right, Democrats on the left. Chuck Schumer worries about um, AOC. Um, other uh, Republicans worry about um, uh, the, the Trumpists to their right. But Alaska has a thing called the jungle primary, um, which will guarantee that the top two vote getters make it to the final uh, round on the Senate ballot. And, and Lisa Murkowski will always make it to the final round. And even if she's the more moderate Republican, she'll, um, and even if she got, if there were more Republicans in a primary, um, just a pure Republican primary, have preferred um, a very conservative right-wing candidate, she would always, you know, have enough votes from the moderate Republicans combined with the Democrats to make it into the top two. And then win the general, every Democrat vote and some Republican vote. So, so Lisa Murkowski, you know, might be tempted to actually, oh, here's the alarm. So I, I got to end here. Um, Lisa Murkowski might be tempted. Susan Collins might be tempted if the Democrats have the slimmest of majorities in the Senate to, to say, ah, we'll caucus with the Democrats. We'd like to be on certain committees. Here are the bills we'd like to have considered. And, and if you, um, uh, and, and we're willing to switch parties the way lots of um, uh, other folks, especially New England Republicans have, have switched party, Jim Jeffords, Lincoln Chaffee and others. Um, um, so um, uh, election 22 is gonna be really important for deciding the fate of the filibuster. So I think I've now said enough. Um, I wanna get you all in the conversation about the filibuster more generally. Now, if you want more on the filibuster, here's what you need to do. Um, in addition to ask me questions, I'm gonna do a share screen. I'm gonna take you to my website um, and it's free, okay? The website um, is akilamr.com. And on this website, uh, um, you can also find a podcast, which is a free weekly kind of um, uh, uh, broadcast uh, that my friend, Dr. Andy Lipkin, and I have put together. We call it America's Constitution. And every week we have a program run from about an hour to an hour and a half. It's free. You can listen to it on Apple iTunes, on Spotify, on Stitcher. There's yours truly. Um, there's my friend, Dr. Andy Lipka. Um, uh, the most recent episode, we actually had a wonderful um, interview with a great First Amendment scholar named Floyd Abrams. Um, last, the previous week, um, we had a great interview um, with uh, Nadine Strossen, uh, who was head of the uh, uh, ACLU for about 17 years, a great civil libertarian. Um, we had, um, uh, this one is all about term limits for justices. That was about three weeks ago. Um, we had a wonderful interview with my friend Bob Woodward, um, uh, to whom uh, one of my recent books is dedicated. But this one, episode 14, April 14th, 2021, ending catch 22. So in this episode, we and one of my colleagues, uh, the great John Fabian Witt, Bancroft Prize winner, um, discuss all things filibuster, including how the Senate can eliminate it on any day. So there's a lot more um, in, in, in um, there. This builds on things that I have written in the popular press. I wrote a piece with former Senator Gary Hart on Slate. Uh, I've written articles. They're all cited to and linked to um, uh, in 
uh, this podcast episode and the associated website. So akilamar.com, Lamarca's Constitution. You'll, if you want more on Catch-22, Rule 22, you'll get a lot more. There are lots of other topics. Um, every week we kind of do a different constitutional law topic. If you want to uh, talk about electoral college reform, um, we have a, a whole session on that, presidential succession. We've got some discussions of that. So, because um, we, we don't have, you know, as much time together as I'd love. Um, so, uh, but, but check out, uh, this was actually, yes, a, a wonderful interview with my dear friend, the, the legendary Bob Woodward, um, who, um, to whom my, uh, my uh, I've got a book that just came out uh, this month, but to my previous book that was, was dedicated. So um, uh, I would just want to share all that with you. Um, I'd love it if you read the new book um, and you can get it from your library, but all this is, uh, 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 is free. Yeah, just in case um, uh, um, you're interested. Okay, um, I promised you about 22 minutes and, I, and my alarm went off, so now it's time to, to switch to Q&A. So, but the filibuster enshrines the concept of the protection of minority rights in the government. Well, you should really love majority rule because it's just multiple minorities. And if, the, if minority rule is so great, my friend, why does the house not use it? Why does the Supreme Court, and I say, oh, the four should beat the five on the Supreme Court if minority rule were so great. And the person who loses, you know, the contest for the governor should actually be the governor because she or he got few of us. So, so, so we haven't talked about, right, here's, so you're not listening to me because actually no founder agreed with you. you. Maybe you're a genius, but, 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 but Benjamin Franklin thought you were wrong. Thomas Jefferson thought you were wrong. John Locke thought you were wrong. Here's what they said. Everyone gets to speak, then everyone gets to vote. So the minority right is you get to make an argument. You don't get to stand up as they do today and read the phone book, which is not making an argument at all. It's just wasting everyone's time. Tyranny of the majority. The word tyranny is doing all the work, my friend. It's not doing any thought. I can say tyranny of the minority. And you know who would I have on my side? Alexander freaking Hamilton. Read the Federalist number 22. And actually, since you wanted, here's a share screen. The new book is dedicated to my friend, Lynn Miranda. That's me and Lynn hanging out together. So the word tyranny is what's doing the work. You have to show me why simple majority is tyrannical because we don't think that on the Supreme Court. Five beats the four. We don't think that in the House of Representatives. Majority prevails. We don't think that when we're voting for a governor. The majority prevails. We don't think that when we're voting for senator. The majority prevails. We don't think that when we're voting for a member of the House of Representatives in any district, okay? So these, I'm being straight with you because I don't have very much time. These are not arguments. They're just little slogans. The word that's doing the work, which is not defended, is the word tyranny. What makes it tyrannical that actually you go with the, the center of gravity? If, it, if it's, why do on the Supreme Court five beat four every single time? Because John Locke was not a, a bozo and neither was Ben Franklin and neither was Thomas Jefferson and none of them, not one of them, not George Washington, not J J James Madison, none of them thought the way you do, not one. And I say that because I've spent my life doing this stuff. And here's my latest book. Okay, it, it's a fat one. It, 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 you know, it required you know, a fair amount of research. So, so maybe you're right and they're all wrong or maybe you've got to rethink things a little bit because here's what I believe in. Everyone gets to talk, then everyone gets to vote. Ah, but when the majority is there because of gerrymandering, there's no such thing as gerrymandering for the US Senate, okay? The Senate is actually, um, uh, and, and, and the concept that the gerrymander did not exist at the time of the constitution, my God, the word gerrymander comes from Elbridge Gerry. He was a founder, okay? So don't, <laughs> let's look at it together. We'll look at, I mean, so you're just saying things that aren't true. Um, that's why you have to read my books. Okay, let's let me, gerrymander Elbridge Gerry. Gerrymander Elbridge Gerry. And um, he was a founder. He was a vice president of the United States. He actually voted against the constitution and he lost because he was in the minority. Um, and we're gonna look up an image and the image is gonna look like a salamander, okay? Yes, there it is. There's the image, that's Elbridge Gerry and his district, you see, looked like, let me move this out of the way here. 
Elbridge Gerry created a district that looks like that. This is um, from Massachusetts. This is Lynn, Chelsea, Marblehead, Danvers. So he created a funny looking district. The founders did all of that stuff. So, um, but even if they didn't, um, it wouldn't matter because you, yours would be an argument about the House of Representatives and not about the Senate. The Senate isn't gerrymandered because it's, it's statewide, always has been. I'm sorry I'm being so fierce with you, but we don't have a lot of time and you know, um, I, I need to just be straight with you. When you make a good argument, I'll, I promise I'll tell you it's a good argument. All right, we have a couple of questions over in the Q&A. Um, our first one is from Richard who wants to know, um, you know, the filibuster has really gotten away from speeches on the Senate floor. And he wants to know when did that change and why? Um, after the Civil War, there were always speeches, but because the Senate was smaller, as a matter, um, um, uh, and, and there were fewer um, items of business. Everyone spoke, and then there was time. Uh, and they, they made their arguments. Oh, so here's actually um, what the, the the actual rule that Thomas Jefferson himself composed. This is his manual for the Senate. Let me actually just read you the rule, because my God, it's just. It, and this is Thomas Freakin Jefferson, and it's so um, explicit here. Um, so. Um, uh, um, uh, this is from Thomas Jefferson's um, um, manual for Senate um, procedure. Um, and uh, so, um, Uh, in the manual for Senate, the, the manual for Senate procedure, um, he says, "Quote: No one is to speak impertinently or beside the question, superfluously or tediously." By like reading a phone book, the voice of the majority decides. For the lex majoris partis, that's Latin for majority rule, is the law of all councils, elections, etc., were not otherwise expressly provided. That's a direct quote from Thomas Jefferson's 1801 Manual of Parliamentary Procedure for the use of the Senate of the United States. He was the vice president um, for the preceding four years and therefore the presiding officer of the Senate, and he came up with this parliamentary manual. So um, the filibuster that we know today began largely after the Civil War, occasionally for civil, um, used by the South to thwart civil rights laws, anti-lynching laws, voting rights laws, famously in the 1890s and then again in the 19 teens. Um, only in the last 25 years, it was used infamously to try to uh, block civil rights legislation in my lifetime. I'm born in 1958, I'm trying to block the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Only in the last 25 years has it been used um, routinely to make the rule of 60 a basic requirement for ordinary garden variety legislation. That's only in the last 30 years. And, and I'm a political scientist. I'm a scholar of, of, uh, of the Senate. Um, I, I'm telling you the actual history. And these are not debatable um, uh, claims. Right. Um, that actually made me think of a question um, that was a comment somebody had said earlier about the fact that the filibuster sort of embodies racism in America. And I was wondering yeah, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't go that far. I would say it has been used for that, but just like majority rule doesn't necessarily mean tyranny, filibuster doesn't necessarily mean racism. Those are analytically distinct things. Historically, it has been used that way. And, and if you want someone who's opposed to the filibuster, but who said just what I said, oh, filibuster hasn't been used so well, but there's maybe nothing intrinsic about it. Listen to that podcast, episode 14, the great John Witt. He had an op-ed on the filibuster. We can look at it together um, in um, the Washington Post. So John Fabian Witt wrote this excellent op-ed about the history of the filibuster um, recently in the Washington Post. Um, and he tells the history of the filibuster um, uh, for a hundred years. Um, okay, so um, the filibuster has been used um, to deny black rights. So that was an historical claim by John Witt um, 
who's a very distinguished uh, uh, a scholar at Yale Law School on March 18th of this year. But, um, and we bring them on the podcast and we say, yes, but is that intrinsic to the filibuster? Is it necessarily the case that it's racist? And he says, no, I don't think so. It could be used for, for good purposes as well as bad. But historically, it was used by the American South, which has been a regional minority in America. Um, and it, it has typically, most famously or infamously, been used to thwart civil rights laws, to block civil rights laws. Um, but, but it's not, you know, it could be used for other purposes as well. Right. Uh, so here's another question um, that we've got in our Q&A. And they're basically asking, um, you know, why, I'll just read the question. Why do many members of Congress from both parties uh, predict chaos if the filibuster is eliminated? Well, many members of Congress say all sorts of batshit crazy things. It doesn't mean it's true. They're not scholars. They're Pauls. Um, and, and hold on. That's true. Hey, listen, I'm a political scientist. I actually, yeah. I testify before them all the time. Okay. And I talk to them when the cameras are off and they don't say the same things as when the cameras are on. Four of my students are senators of the United States at this moment. Chris Coons, J Josh Hawley, Michael Bennett, Cory Booker. Okay. So... They actually twice in recent memory voted for the nuclear option. The Democrats did under Harry Reid, the Republicans did under Mitch McConnell, knowing that when they did that, a majority on any, further, on any future day could do the same thing on any issue. So whatever they say, with all due respect, whoever asked that question, Senate majorities are actually on my side because twice in, that's how they voted. Okay, they can say whatever they want, um, and 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 uh, so, and, but it doesn't mean it's so. It doesn't mean they have a good argument. It just means that, for example, there they may have a donor that doesn't want this. They may want to, you know, have more leverage over certain issues, and and they will have more um, voting power if they need to get to fifty-five or sixty than fifty-one or something like that. But I know these guys, and. Um, uh, and, uh, and the mere fact that senators say something to me no longer counts that much as an argument. And that wasn't true 20 years ago. I respected them a lot more. I'm a Democrat who testified on behalf of Brett Kavanaugh. Um, uh, this was before the Christine Blasey Ford thing. I'm not a partisan person. What goes around comes around. If the Democrats do it, and I told Harry Reid's folks this, the Republicans are gonna be able to do it um, when, when, when they're in charge. So the rules have to be the same for both parties, but much of what is said in Washington is just not true. Right. So um, we have some more questions coming in. I had a question I was wondering if you could- And by the that. way, we can talk about things other than the filibuster. Remember, I'm, I'm willing to talk to you about anything else and, and, and my books are about things way beyond the filibuster, which I, you know, I, maybe we should have, you know, another, we'll do a, a, another event where we can talk about other things, but I'm, yeah. I'm happy because I honestly don't think that there are that debatable things here, and we're just, um, I've already asked, answered most of the, the points, but yeah. I'll, I'll keep answering the questions if you, if you keep wanting to talk about that. Well, one question I was just thinking is, um, you know, we've, now we've been living with this Rule 22 for quite a while. Do, do you see any sort of, um, long-term impacts in sort of the, in, you know, if we've had 25 years of, um, like you said, sort of this rule being used of, on- Of, of gridlock, of, 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 I, I, right, like, and for 25 years, I say as in a story, some of the worst years in America because the parties actually don't work together in the way that they used to. So these years have been uniquely dysfunctional I assert as, a, as an historian of the thing. And it didn't used to be that way, but most of you don't remember what it was like um, before that. I do because I'm an historian and I study how it is that we, we got other, um, we, we got landmark pieces of legislation through like the compromise of 1850 by simple majority votes, you know? Uh, um, so, um, 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 it's only been in the last 30 years that uh, you've needed 60 votes for ordinary garden variety pieces of legislation. The filibuster used to be used 
only on the rarest of occasions. It was a talking filibuster. Um, they didn't have a thing called two tracks. I don't want to, I can't get into all the details of Senate procedure here to show you how actually the system that we have now is not the system that we had even 40 years ago and definitely not what the framers had, not at all. Right. So you can be for it, but then Benjamin Franklin was wrong and Thomas Jefferson was wrong and all the founders were wrong and James Madison was wrong and John Locke was wrong and maybe so. Yeah. Or you can actually, you know, do, we, do we have this in every state legislature? No, we don't. Do we have this in the House of Representatives? No, we don't. Now, I don't love the House. The House is a snake pit. But it's a snake pit in part because of gerrymandering, in part because a great percentage of the House districts are extreme right or extreme left AOC districts, extreme left um, hard right districts. That's not true of um, the states. Many more states are purple states. They're in the middle. Um, so many more senators are naturally in the middle. It's a six year term. It's a smaller body, but goes round, comes round. So the Senate actually can operate with simple majority rule and still be a very good deliberative body. The Supreme right. Court operates by majority rule and it's a good deliberative body. Again, it's smaller, it turns over less quickly. Um, uh, people cross the aisle more. Um, so um, the House actually uses majority rule. The House is not a lovely place at all. It's a very partisan place. The Senate need not be so partisan. So even if we have filibuster reform, oh, whoever's in the majority would be very wise to say, I can ram this through with 51, but I won't. I'd rather have 60. So if I can make some adjustments, I'd rather have 65. I'd rather have 80. Um, so even though I've got 51, um, if I can actually make adjustments and bring more people on, I'd prefer to do that. But I won't get there unless I can get it with 51. Some of you are parents. I'm a parent. Okay. If the kid, no, I have three kids. And if the kid understands that if push comes to shove, I can send the kid to the room. And I got to get mom on my side. But if we can send the kid, to, then actually we never have to. Because we just have to say, well, you know, don't make us send you to your room. Don't, you know. So, so um, if we only need 51, don't make us do this by the simplest of majorities. Um, we want to bring you on board. We want to wind it, but, but, but we'll be able to do that if we can do it by the simplest of majorities. We'll be more likely to be able to actually have a bipartisan coalition, a broader one. Um, so I here is someone is asked a, about Scalia and Heller. I saw just on my screen, but but what, what you saw some other questions. We do have we do have quite a few questions coming in. Um, all right, so we have one. I guess so. We have a few questions here that are a question from Philip, a question from Janet that are all sort of alluding to sort of this, you know, how deeply bipartisan things have become and how you know, certain legislators are sort of entrenched in their own party philosophies, whether it's you know, believing election results not to be yeah. accurate or, um, yeah. you know, yeah. but is there any, do you have any insights to like, uh, um, uh, how I'm we got here and where to go? <laughs> and the, uh, here's why this, um, uh, uh, we're much more partisan than ever before because there are no conservative Democrats and no liberal Republicans. And that's because of um, shifts that began in 1965 that, that uh, created a profound realignment. You used to have Southern conservative Democrats. You used to have New England, Rockefeller Republicans. No more, I can't, I don't have, you know, you have nine minutes to explain, but I, pr uh, I promise you in, in many of my podcasts and many of my other work, I explain how that came to be that the most conservative Democrat, Joe Manchin is, uh, or Kristen Sinema is still to the left of the most liberal Republican, uh, um, Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins. So, so there's been complete um, ideological polarization and gridlock and dysfunction. And all I'm telling you is that has come about at the same time that the filibuster is being used routinely. And, and so maybe there's a connection between those and maybe we shouldn't have the routine use of the filibuster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That when the Democrats are in charge, they can do things. When the Republicans are in charge, they can do things. And if you don't like those things and you have to vote against them at the next election, but we can actually get stuff done. 
Um, so we do have a question that sort of moves away from the filibuster, and it's a question of constitutional interpretation. Um, Scalia's decision in Heller seems to have simply ignored the first clause of the Second Amendment about a well-regulated militia. What does that do to textualism? Does politics trump legal philosophy? Well, I'm really glad you asked. Um, I don't own a gun. I never have. Um, they scare me. And um, Heller is not a great decision because Scalia is not a great constitutionalist, truth be told. Um, uh, but Heller is easily and obviously correct. Um, and, um, and would be so even if we didn't have the Second Amendment because, the f okay, so let's do a share screen. Um, this is why, you know, you guys, okay, I'm gonna, before I do a share screen, I'm gonna actually be straight with you. You're serious, you have serious questions. We can't answer serious questions in 30 seconds. Okay, sure. that's why I write books. Now, if you're serious, I'm being fierce because the world is going to hell because no one knows anything. Now, if you're serious, because I'm a serious person, I've written books that are very serious. All you have to do, damn it, is read them. In, in five seconds, if you don't even want to read the books, just Google Akhil Amar, Second Amendment. And in one minute, you can actually read a five page, not 50 page discussion of how to think about the Second Amendment. And then it'll take you to books, which will give you much more documentation for what I do in the five pages. So please, I want you to read the books because you can't know, you can't discharge your responsibilities as a citizen unless you actually know stuff. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you in one minute um, uh, um, why Scalia in the end is right and forget the Second Amendment. Um, so let me take a step back. I live two towns away from Newtown. Um, one of the girls who was killed in Newtown, um, Grace McDonald, is a friend of a friend. Our uh, uh, um, tutor, Tim Napolitano, um, tutored my kids and, and, and the McDonald kids. This affected me very personally. Um, I personally briefed the entire House of Representatives on gun control immediately after Newtown in a closed caucus in which Barack Obama spoke, excuse me, um, Joe Biden spoke, then Akhil Amar spoke, then Barack Obama spoke, okay? So I'm a serious person and I'm gonna tell you serious stuff on this, but I, I don't have you know, a lot of time to do this. Um, so you have to read what I've written and, and I've written about just about everything that you're interested in. Um, this is my best book, The Words That Made Us. It's, it doesn't have that much on the second amendment, but um, it has stuff on so many things that will change the way you think about constitutional law. We'll do a share screen because I was supposed to talk to a very great journalist that day, um, Ezra Klein, about, believe it or not, filibuster reform. We had scheduled um, like a Zoom call, but Newtown had just happened and neither of us wanted to talk about filibuster reform. So he asked me about the second amendment and I'll show you what I said. We share screen, you can find this in 30 seconds. Neil Amar, Ezra Klein, Second Amendment. A history of the Second Amendment in two paintings. I can show you in two images what the Second Amendment is about. Okay. Uh, December 15th, 2012, this is the day of Newtown. Are you at a computer? Asked to kill Reed Amar, professor at, at Yale Law School. I had called him because we had scheduled a talk to talk about the Constitution of the filibuster, just what we've been talking about, okay? But just a few hours before our call, a madman had killed 26 people, mostly children, at a Connecticut elementary school. Neither of us was very interested in talking about the filibuster. So I asked Amar, one of the nation's leading authorities, about the Second Amendment. That's when he sent me to Google. Okay, type in John Trumbull, you know, okay, so... This is what the Second Amendment means at the founding. And it's done by John Trumbull, whose father was governor of Connecticut, Jonathan Trumbull, whose brother was governor of Connecticut, Jonathan Trumbull Jr. And it's Lexington, it's the Battle of Bunker Hill. And it's about the original Second Amendment vision, which is a local militia. That's the preamble that was referred to by the questioner. Local militia against the King's army. Um, uh, and this is all about the original vision of the Second Amendment. And there's one black person right here. This person and this person are from Connecticut. And I explain all of that in my books, by the way. And they're um, up at, at, at Bunker Hill. And, and the original of this hangs in the Yale University Art Gallery. There's some other um, versions of this. 
This is the original Second Amendment vision. And yes, it is military and local and 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 Scalia it just tries to ignore all that because it doesn't support his argument, but he's not a constitutional scholar. He just happens to be a justice, you know, but but he hasn't written books on the constitution. Now, after the Civil War, this gets reconceptualized. This is the new Second Amendment vision. And you see flag of the central government in the middle, flag of the central government in the middle. One government officer with his left hand extended the middle, one government officer with his left hand extended. One black guy here, whole bunch of black guys on this side. The, the uh, militiamen have become Klansmen. This is a different vision of the Second Amendment. Almost everything that you think comes from the Bill of Rights does not come from the Bill of Rights. It comes from the 14th Amendment. And I wrote a book about the 14th Amendment. I'm ending the share screen here um, called um, The Bill of Rights, Creation and Reconstruction. Okay, so here's, I'm gonna actually, believe it or not, it's just a complicated answer um, to um, a good um, uh, question. Um, uh, so uh, let me open up my, uh, I will stop the share, there we go. Okay, so here's the book, The Bill of Rights. After the Civil War, the Bill of Rights comes to apply against state and local governments and in the process is transformed. It moves from being a military right of localities when, um, to a right of individuals. When guns are outlawed in the founding, only the king's men will have guns. The central government, that's bad. We want local militias to have guns. That's the Second Amendment vision and it doesn't support Scalia very much. But after the 14th Amendment, that right comes to apply against state and localities. We call that incorporation of the Bill of Rights against states. And the idea is those black people in that picture have to have guns in their homes for self-protection because if they don't, no one will protect them when the Klan comes calling. When guns are, so the central government and the flag and the constitution this is like Ulysses S. Grant, they're gonna protect these black people in their homes. They get to have these guns that they are bring, coming back from, from the Civil War, in their homes for self-protection, because otherwise no one will protect them when the Klan comes calling. When guns are outlawed, only Klansmen will have guns. That's the NRA slogan today, when guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. The National Rifle Association was founded after the Civil War by a group of ex-Union Army officers, not to repeat. I don't have a gun in my house. They scare me. I don't want to have a gun in my house. But this is America. If you want a gun in your house, you actually have that right. That's easy and obvious. It should have been 9-0. And, and if you just want a little bit more on that, read that Ezra Klein piece. It's, it's it, you know, a history of the Second Amendment in two paintings. I explained to Ezra in about five minutes. I only had three to do it to, to you all. But you're serious. You're asking big and serious questions. And I've just got to tell you that the world is going to hell because ordinary citizens aren't reading. Um, um, and that's why in an event like this is so important. But at the end of the day, I got to do it in books rather than in, in sound bites. Um, that is actually a really great segue. Um, you know, because we are at five o'clock, which means any great questions. We do not have really time to answer, but like I said, we are selling copies of your newest book. Um, I'm going to put a link uh, in the chat feature right now, um, which is where you can purchase this book from our website. And, and you can read little snippets and reviews on amazon.com from experts and, and, and folks. It's, it's, a, it's a very serious book. And, and I think truthfully that, that's, um, of what everyone is saying. Uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, this is my life's work, this book. And I wouldn't ask you to read it if I didn't think that almost all of you, when you, it's, it's gonna take time. Um, but when you read it, you will know so much more than you know now. You'll know more than half of what I know. You'll know more than I knew before I started writing this book because I taught myself about the book. And, and I just can't give you all the details on all your serious questions you know, in such a compressed time. But I promise you, the book will change how you think about the American Constitution. Yes, one and hour is a Which is a great project. I'm, I'm a big, big believer in the American Constitution. Um, and, and I also tell you what was, you know, where, where it was flawed, slavery, for example. We, we fought a civil war because it was an imperfect document. 
Um, but you won't know how it was imperfect. You won't know how the Second Amendment changed into the 14th Amendment. You won't know um, how um, uh, um, uh, um, any of the amendments um, happened. Um, um, let, let me give you a, just a, an analogy um, on, on the Second Amendment. You won't know what, what the Ninth Amendment means when it talks about unenumerated rights. Even if there weren't a Second Amendment, the right to have a gun in your home for self-protection might be an unenumerated right. The right to have sex in your home is an unenumerated right. Liberals believe in sex in the home. Conservatives believe in guns in the home. I say, this is America. Give them both what they want. You know, you know, um, uh, personally, you know, I, I, I prefer sex. I don't like guns, but, but whatever floats your boat, this is America, but where do unenumerated rights come from? Well, these books are going to tell you where. But let me give you an analogy just on the Second Amendment, since that's an interesting one. If you're a Christian, you read the Old Testament through the prism of the New Testament. You say, well, it's not that uh, the book of Isaiah, you read it not as if it says a young woman shall give birth, but you read it as if it says a virgin shall give birth. You um, um, see the personality of God, not as Yahweh, but as Abba Father. You take an earlier set of scriptures and you read them through a later set of texts. You read them through the prism of the life, death, resurrection ministry of this reformist rabbi from Nazareth named Jesus. So you read earlier texts in light of later texts. That's what you have to do when you're reading the Constitution. The whole thing, not one clause of one amendment, which does say malicious, but how that got changed after the Civil War, how it fits with unenumerated rights, how the whole thing fits together. And yes, I agree with you. Um, Scalia doesn't do that. Heller is not actually um, uh, that great an opinion. It gets the right result, though. In America, people have right to have guns in their homes for self-protection. It's in every state, virtually every state constitution. It's an unenumerated right, but, but only in the books can I actually take you, reader, by the hand and walk you through and show you not just, um, you know, tell you what I think is the right answer, but show you why it's the right answer. Oh, because it says this and it says that, and this happened and that happened and this didn't happen and so on. So, so um, I promise you, that in the fall, if the Historical Society invites me, I'll come to Litchfield. I want to meet each one of you. I'll sign, you know, every book that you like. I'll stay till the last dog dies so we can just talk about you know, anything beyond what we've been able to do today. Because the Republic dies unless people like you, who care a lot, you're, you're spending your Sunday with me. Thank you very much. People like you actually um, feed this deep hunger that you have for serious engagement with the issues that you care about. And I, I want to offer you serious engagement. I can only do so much on Zoom. The podcasts are free every week. Check those out. The website has all sorts of material, akilamar.com. The books are best of all because I can really give you all the citations and the evidence. And, and truthfully, this is the one that I'm most proud of, the words that made us, the US, how we became who we are, black and white, um, Republican and Democrat, um, uh, how male and female, how we became an us. Wonderful. And we, um, we certainly are in the works of sort of getting a book signing together um, for hopefully when, um, you know, when our in-person program returns. So I that would be um, a wonderful chance. So if you do read the book, you can bring questions um, to the book signing. Um, all right, well, uh, I, you know, I think you really hit the nail on the head when you just said, you know, um, thank, thank you really to our, our audience for coming in on a, on a really nice Sunday afternoon to, to engage on some really important topics to better understand sort of how our government works and to stay engaged and educated. Um, and Akil, thank you so much for, you know, sharing that expertise with us um, and being this amazing resource. Um, Really, thank you so much.